Hi, I'm Edward Samuelson, and welcome to The Cinephiles, the show that allows you to eavesdrop on the conversation of fellow film fanatics. Today, in honor of the late Harvey Corman, we are going to be discussing uh, the films of Mel Brooks, which is where he made his name as a comedic actor, uh, also on The Carol Burnett Show, of course, but Mel Brooks is uh, where he really got his, I guess you say, his film experience. Anyway, before I begin, let me introduce our panel to my left, Mr. Eric Cohen, to his left, Jeff Galishaw, and his left, Michael Fultz. Let's start off with uh, uh, Mel Brooks' first film, um, which was The Producers. Uh, before Mel Brooks made The Producers, he was a writer for Sid Caesar on a show called Your Show of Shows. Um, he parlayed this into a uh, screenwriting career, which led to The Producers, which is, um, again, uh, um, him, um, Mel Brooks' first Oscar for Best Original Screenplay, if I'm not mistaken. That's ironic, too, that Sid Caesar, Sid Caesar died this year as well. He did, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't, I didn't even realize But Mel Brooks that. is still alive. Well, Mel Brooks is still alive and kicking, and uh, in fact, he's now become a playwright, actually, with the producers being adapted into a Broadway musical, which was very successful. Unfortunately, the movie version was not. Um, he now just went and made uh, Young Frankenstein to a uh, musical, and that will probably be on the screen as well soon. Yeah, but, but this isn't as successful as the producers. No, it's not. But uh, let's start off with the producers, which, of course, uh, is really one of the most... Uh, a unique comedy films of its time. Um, fucking hilarious. This, this film is fucking hilarious. You could make an argument that maybe it's a little dated. I don't think it is. I think it's very fresh. And I think a film like this, which um, really lives and dies by the strength of its two leads, um, really succeeds because... Zero Mostel, who was a very famous actor back then, who was unfortunately blacklisted for a long time because of, uh, uh, what's his name, Elia Kazan, put him on the, uh, the list, the blacklist, I guess you could say. And Gene Wilder as the... Uh, accountant. Yeah, as the accountant. Leo Bloom. Leo Bloom. I mean, their back and forth when they first meet is comedy gold that to this day is very Abbott and Costello, very... Just out of left field, this insane stuff. You could definitely tell that um, Carl Reiner had a, a major influence on on the tone of this. I mean, Zero Mostel just screaming in Leo Bloom's ear. Uh, and, he even looks like Carl Reiner. And, and Gene Wilder just going into these various periods of neuroses. Uh, and, and, the blue blankie. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's just... You can tell that Mel Brooks and these two actors are just, they're insane and they're having a wonderful time. The whole thing is great though. Like even like Kenneth, the late great Kenneth Mars plays the, the, the playwright, the, the neo-Nazi guy. That uh, he, it's still one of my favorite sight gags he's, in history with the helmet. Yeah, oh, he's fucking hilarious. Uh, and something that they changed on the Broadway production, uh, but the actor they choose to play Hitler I forgot the character's uh, name. Dick Sean. Dick Sean, LSD yeah. is the character's name. That is hilarious. Yeah. He play, it, it's a hippie that's playing Hitler right. using hippie dialogue at the time. And 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 the, the play is, is done in such a way because the play is being done by a renowned drag queen who is known for doing gay plays. And the actor is Christopher Hewlett, who actually became better known as Mr. Belvedere. Belvedere. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's even funnier. Yeah, once maybe. they have this guy introduced, <laughs> I mean, uh, Mel Brooks is doing such a wonderful job of uh, upping the ante throughout. So when you see this true nightmare on stage, which is this hippie play, but all the hippies are really Nazis, and I mean, it's just like, <laughs> and, you know, and when, I mean, when you see nothing is more wonderful than seeing Dick Sean come out strutting along and dressed as a, a stormtrooper, dressed as Hitler going, asking for where Joseph Goebbels is, and he keeps going, where's my little Joe? Where's my little Joe? <laughs> and the costume is great, too. It's like like all the, like the, the, the chorus line had like, you know, the pretzels, and but it's like this like really high cut stuff, and it's intentionally ridiculously How Mel Brooks sexy. It's like convinced a, a studio <laughs> yeah, to it, put this fever dream on screen? I don't know, but it's he, he's just wonderful. What's so funny is that in fact, if you listen to the end of the musical, uh, they actually can hear Mel Brooks make his appearance and voice. Don't be in a Swatsy join that come and join a Nazi party. That's Mel Brooks' voice. Um, ironically, when the film was after it was completed, it was a very low budget film. You can obviously see that in the, in the movie. Um, the studio didn't have much faith in the film, and in fact. Um, Peter Sellers actually saw the film and loved the movie so much he actually paid and took an ad out and telling people to see the producers, which actually got it some exposure and led to it being a cult classic, which it is today. Um, I just saw it. I think of that's those scenes with Kenneth Mars and I Want to Die, especially when he's in the audience with his little tuxedo and he has his helmet eating the popcorn. Yeah, <laughs> but once hysterical. Dick Sean 
uh, LSD says baby too much. He's like, baby, baby. And that's what he just finally lets loose and wants to start killing the actors. Oh. But it just, just a clue in, in case people have been living under a rock because the Broadway musical version, you know, uh, Whatever. Kind of exploded, even though the film version didn't. Uh, the whole premise is brilliant in itself and that in order to make money, they have to create a show that will go bankrupt so that the investors can't make their money back. And they'll pocket the, the right, money. and they'll pocket the money. But what happens is the show becomes a hit. Yeah, they try and make the worst musical on Broadway. That is the goal, and they do it a step by step process to make sure that everything they put together is going to be a disaster. Right. And actually, from my understanding, this is—I don't know if this is true. I believe this, the, the movie is actually based on a true story of someone actually trying to do this intentionally. But of course, this is a hugely comical version of that. Now, Jeff, you got to say something about the producers. I mean, do you have a scene that just stands out that makes you? Giggle like me? Well, not giggle, laugh. Um, <laughs> but there is one scene in particular. Um, it's when the guy in the audience gives uh, the play a standing ovation, and then everybody looks at him and th hits him with a paper and throws things at, at him. I just thought that was genius. But uh, the whole movie just is filled with memorable things. It's it's a shame that I mean there's still good comedies being made today, but there is. No way that they could get away with half the stuff they were getting away with back then, at least with Mel Brooks. And I also don't think that anybody might be as comically gifted as he was back then. This is him starting to show his peak. Because unfortunately for me, like Woody Allen, his early films are his best films. And as he got older, mm -hmm. there were still some things that were good about his films, but they really diminished a lot. Well, he became a parody of himself. That was the problem. But I will say that Mel Brooks was a really, at his beginning stages, was a very unique comic director. There was no one else like him doing these things. I mean, he would go for broke no matter what with a laugh. Like, look at this. Taking on the Nazis, Most he got a lot of flack for that. But he said, what better way to get back to the Nazis than to make them jokes? He also had a great repertory of actors initially. Oh, yes, he did. Which really understood the humor. That's why his later films also don't work as well either, because then he started going for people that were famous at that time, like Leslie Nielsen or you know Rick Moranis, you know people like well, Richard that, Lewis, Carrie who Elvis, don't really work Tracy in the Mel Brooks Elvis. you know kind of world. Whereas whereas the people like you know Gene Wilder, Harvey Korman, you know Dom DeLuise, those guys, they fit that so perfectly. They know how to nail that humor. Well, they're from the same era and com right. school, school of comedy that he was, and that's why they work so well in his universe. But moving on to the next film. The next film, and actually, this is a film which is actually based on an old Russian folktale. I know you guys have not seen it, but we'll just discuss it briefly. It's probably his least seen film of, the, of that era, which was called The Twelve Chairs. Um, this one stars... Um, uh, Ron Moody. Ron Moody, who and Frank Langella. Yeah, and it was a. Uh, this one is the concerns the hunt for a chair which had jewels uh, hidden in them. Uh, it's an interesting film. It doesn't feel like a Mel Brooks film. It's 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 like Mel Brooks even admitted I he was trying to do his sort of like foreign Euro comedy kind of thing, and it was shot like in, like somewhere like like Prague or something like that. And um, I don't think I, I don't really remember much of the film. I saw it and thinking, oh, is this a Mel Brooks film? I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's not really a, like a comedy. It's more like a not even a farce. It's just a light-hearted you know comedy movie. You know, it's, it's the humor is secondary to the adventure where the people get into these you know these situations where they're trying to find a chair and will do nothing. It's basically a mad mad world with the chair. People looking for the chair. To yeah, get it feels the money. like a 1960s, like an early 1960s kind of comedy, like a mad 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 world. Maybe not quite as manic. It's a fun movie. I do recommend you guys seeing it. I do, but it's not. Don't go in there looking for a, a comedy. It's it's just a fun, lighthearted movie. It's just, it's basically like a low version, a low budget version of a Mad Mad World. Gotcha. Done. But anyway, uh, the next film actually um, was a film that actually was very hard for Mel Brooks to make. It took a lot and a lot of work, but he got it to the screen. And uh, actually, one of the writers on it was a young writer named Andrew Bergman. And the script originally was called Tex X, and it was later. Uh, 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 the title later titled Blazing Saddles. One of the other co-writers was uh, Richard Pryor, who was originally wanted to be the lead in the movie, but of course the studio said he couldn't be in the lead because of his, you know, his risque humor. So they decided to cast the television actor Cleavon Little, and uh, of course we got Gene Wilder again, who was great in the producers, and today has, I guess you could say, is probably his best known and most successful film. The Blazing Saddles is 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 his highest. I, would just, if it's, I don't. I, I wouldn't would, say I it's bigger say than Willy Wonka. Well, he's no, 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 we're no, talking no. about, no, we're talking about Mel Brooks. Oh, think, I'm sorry, I, I thought Frank you were talking about Gene Wilder. Yeah, I'm his sorry. most respected yeah. film. Oh, uh, yeah, well, Mel, it's Mel, Mel Brooks' most successful film. It made a fortune, and then it gave him some status Duly, Dooley noted, though, that 
it is a funny damn it film once again. Yes. I mean, it is. It's like airplane before you can airplane. still you can still quote Blazing Saddles. You can still quote this what film. Wow, wow, world of sports is going on around here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's Slim kill Pickens. Is I got an idea. Let's go around and kill their firstborn. Mm, too Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I like. Uh, <laughs> and my favorite thing, my favorite gag, is when, when Mel Brooks is the Indian chief. The Indians show up and they're speaking Yiddish. <laughs> it's like. Ah. Now, they, there is uh, many a memorable scene. There's not a bad scene in the whole film. But my favorite scene, surprisingly, does not involve Harvey Korman. It actually involves Dom DeLuise, where they go on the sound stage and they're doing this uh, Broadway show, and then he's like, Stop! Watch me faggots! And then he does the, <laughs> and then he does the whole scene, and then he trips in the last. He goes, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> And I just thought, uh, you know, out of all the gags I can remember, <laughs> when I rewatched it recently, it was just that one just stood out for me for some odd well, This reason. is how iconic <laughs> and, and favorite this film is. When when uh, we got, I, I work for a photo agency, we get some news feeds and stuff like that. And when they announced that Harvey Corman died, uh, my boss, one of the first things he said was, the name's Headley Lamar, you know, and then yeah. that comes from that film. And yes, yeah. That's, that's Harvey Corman. My, my, or what about one of the great quotes of all time? Where are the white women at? <laughs> yeah. My favorite scene is one, people don't even think is like one of the funnier scenes, but there's a scene that's like, we got to delay them. What do we do? So they put up a toll booth. And then and, and you see Slim Pickens goes, oh, God damn it, send someone back to get me a shitload of dimes. Oh, my favorite thing is when they had the brilliant idea of creating a fake town with, like, fake cardboard cutouts, and the villains show up, and it takes them all to figure out that's a fake town. <laughs> and it's just so ridiculous. But I mean, how, how about that one guy? I don't know the actor's name, but he was in, so he was, like, a, a bit player in so many movies, but when he was, like, sitting there going, St. Cap Town Racetrack, real nice. <laughs> Oh, and let's not forget uh, Jack Starrett. I forget he's doing, a, you know, the very famous uh, director who directed many films uh, like uh, Race with the Devil. And he's also in Rambo is one of the deputies. He plays the, you know, rrr, 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 you know, the guy with the mustache. Right. He's, he's doing the very famous uh, Western character, a parody of it. I can't think of his name. He's terrific, too. Well, what about George Papadopoulos? I mean, come on, Mongo. Alex, Car Alex Karras. Oh, yeah. Or yeah, Alex, Alex Karras. Karras. Yeah. yeah, Slim Pickens is great in it, too. He's parodying the parts that he would play in Westerns. Uh, you know, you and Cleveland Little's Webster great. <laughs> Even though it would be interesting to see Richard Pryor in it, but Cleveland Little's great. And let's not forget David Huddleston. Oh, that's the, right. That, yeah. And that was the, that, the guy he was playing. Was, Can someone tell me what this frontier gibberish is? That was the guy. Uh, that's Jack Stark. And let's character. not forget Madeline Kahn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I also, my favorite part of the film is the ending. I mean, the ending, the the infamous fight scene that goes all over, especially when they're all sitting in the commissary, like having their meal or whatever, and then the fight comes in. I mean, that's when the movie just goes from awesome comedy just like magical status that it, they, this just fight scene just does not stop and I mean that's and, I, and this is what's funny is that it, it breaks the third wall and um, I mean it shatters it it shatters <laughs> it I mean I, I've never you don't it's just like how the hell can this work and it works brilliantly because it completely funny. it goes completely out of that universe and doesn't go back and but it, it ends on a wonderful high note and it's definitely a wonderful film one of or the even when Gene Wilder is demonstrating how fast he is Oh, by the way, one thing I got to mention is I don't know if you. I, I remember one years, many years ago, I saw the Family Channel version of this movie, oh. and I love it. That of course they leave on all the N words because that's you know in the movie, but they cut out the scene of the, one of the people punching the horse, which I thought was pretty Mongo. Good I think Mongo punches the yeah, horse. Yeah, Mongo punches. The I, horse. I mean, isn't that ironic on the Family Channel? Pat Robertson. I remember being a little kid seeing a film, and I thought it was so funny to hear all the fart noises. Yeah, yeah, as he's beans. eating the beans. <laughs> and I think it's even funnier too on the Family Channel version. They they take the, the, the whole the, all the foley out of the farting. Of course, the people are just like getting up and going like this, and he goes, God damn it, stop eating all those beans. Let's go on to the next film. The next film, okay. Well, the next film actually is, uh, I believe, would be my personal favorite uh, Mel Brooks film. In fact, it's a homage to the wonderful Universal films of the 1930s, uh, specifically Young uh, Frankenstein, and the film is Young Frankenstein. Um, this one, I have to say, of all the films I've ever seen trying to do, um, you know, recreate the era and the look, this one does a wonderful job. It oh, really this looks really, like I it. I mean, this really proved Brooks' metal as a filmmaker. It's the only Mel Brooks film where he himself doesn't. I mean, is, he's not in the 12 He years. is not in the film at this all. This is one of the few films where he doesn't appear in. He is in the 12 chairs. He, uh, oh, okay, he is. He's not, this is the only one he's made that he's not really in. And he's. And this is a really well-made movie. I mean, A, he nails that period universal horror look. Mm -hmm. But 
he, it still is funny. I mean, the timing in this film, it, it's a great, it's one of my favorite movies, let alone favorite Mel Brooks film. It, and and apparently he even used the sets that were originally used. Yeah, some Universal of the equipment. Horror films and he all used that the stuff. one from Frankenstein. But God, man, um, what's his name? Marty Feldman. He's hilarious. <laughs> Igor. Uh, Gene Wilder is even. He, he is hilarious in this film with his Frankenstein. Terry Gar. Terry Gar's great. Would you like to roll in the hay? Great uh, moment. I, and well, who can forget the great Peter Boyle? Oh, Peter Boyle. Mm, Peter oh, the Boyle. putting on the Ritz bit. That I was. Uh, when I saw it the first time, I thought I was going to have a hernia. I was laughing well, so hard. Well, let's not forget our favorite Oscar winner, too, Gene Hackman, who as the yes. blind Oh, Herman, brilliant who sequence. Who is absolutely Uncredited. brilliant. He plays it perfectly. He do, he plays it straight, and he comes off as funny. It's the funniest you'll ever see Gene Hackman Cigars. in Cigars! And I just love, I love the whole thing with the soup. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, and Kenneth Mars. Yes, as the has to pump up his arm. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> He's like, let's come over for some sponge cake and oh shit. That's a great <laughs> moment with his arm. It's just, it's such a, oh man, it's such a oh, great wait, I, I love um, him lighting his thumb on fire. <laughs> Madeline yeah, Kahn is, is funny in it. Uh, Cloris Leachman is awesome as Frau Bucher. Their voice, who I went with the horses. Which, if I'm not mistaken, mm. Blucher means horse fucker in English or something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Mm, that was like the big right. joke in that. Don't know. But the film, I have to say, too, they even made the film, I mean, even though it's, it's shot in black, I mean, it really looks like it was like taken out of a time capsule from the 1930s. I mean, they really did their work. They got the, like, the, even the emotion scratches, everything. Very skillfully made film. And this um, is a real filmmaking. I mean, and a very, you could tell that he loved those movies. It was a, it's a very loving, affectionate parody of those films. And, uh, but it's still a Mel Brooks film, though. Yeah. That's the thing. In the end, it's still a Mel Brooks. Would <laughs> you say? Would you? Would you like this one more than Blazing Saddles, or would you put it? Uh, almost, no, I like Blazing Saddles more. I like Blazing Saddles more. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think Blazing Saddles is the most more gut wrenching, funny film. But I think that Young Frankenstein is a more accomplished film. I think I think it's his masterpiece. I think it's it's probably the best made comedy I've ever seen in terms of As real a film filmmaking. fan, it's I filmmaking. like Young Frankenstein better, but I acknowledge that Blazing Saddles it has more laughs for your dollar. Mm -hmm. Let's get into the next film, which is actually a film I think of his that is underrated. Not many people Silent talk movie. about it. Silent Movie, I think, is a very unique film. Actually, at the time, think about it. He made a film completely, except for one word, all silent, and. Um, I mean, that's a hard sell even back in the 70s, I would say, wouldn't you? Well, but he was such a success at the time. You know, it was like, sure, let's give it to But him. the 70s, that was a period that everybody as a film fan should know was a time to take the risks. Oh, I, absolutely. And I think it's one of his uh, most entertaining films, actually. I mean, in spite of it being no dialogue, I, I just watched it like an old two-reeler. Two I think I think it's an interesting experiment, and I applaud him for for attempting it. I'm a big fan of like silent comedies and physical comedy. If it's done well, it, it's it's amazing to watch, like the Charlie Chaplin's and Buster Keaton's all that stuff, because nobody can do that shit now. I mean, nobody. Uh, I think uh, some of it falls flat. I th I think that they're they're kind of obvious punchlines that kind of land kind of in a you know thud rather than you know really. But there's there are some very like like I think that scene where. They're in the they're in the commissary lunch, you know, and they're trying to get uh, what's her name, um, Liza Minnelli, to be in their film, but they were all in like the night outfits, you know, and the armor, and, and they just keep collapsing. And it's just ridiculous. It goes on and on, but it's funny. And the scene with Burt Reynolds is funny, where they're all in the shower. I think the scene that what had me dying was the one with James Conn in the trailer, I believe, with the punching bag, where he's fighting, and I believe they're in the mobile home or whatever, and oh, yeah, he's going funny. back and forward. I mean, and that's another thing too. He got a lot of famous celebrities to be in the movie, which actually added to the real life Hollywood feel of the movie. Um, I definitely think it's his most underrated film. I mean, it's had some problems. I do agree with you, but it's an interesting experiment for him to pull it off. In what do you guys something? think of it? I gotta say, I haven't seen it since since I was a kid. Really? Did you like it when you were a kid? Yeah, I, I was entertained. I was always entertained by Mel Brooks, but <laughs> just you mentioning some scenes, I kind of that jogs the memory. But it's not one of the more memorable scene. It's not one of the more memorable films that I've seen recently because the other films that we've talked about, I have seen. And it wasn't one of those films, too, that played a lot on cable, too, to catch it in, like, reruns. Not really. No, he played on, like, Channel 5 a lot when I was a kid. High Anxiety, which uh, is uh, Alfred, uh, his, his homage to uh, Alfred Hitchcock in the films of Alfred Hitchcock, especially, like, Vertigo, The Bird, Psycho. Um, Alfred Hitchcock actually saw, saw the film and really loved it and actually, I believe, sent him a note thanking him for his affectionate homage. Um, this one is actually co-written by future director uh, Barry Levinson and has many wonderful... Uh, gags, you know, in the vein. And Barry cycle. Levinson has the most memorable, uh, memorable cameo in the film as well. Oh yeah, as the uh, paper delivery boy, or the uh, the concierge. Here's your paper. 
I, 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 and actually, and let's not forget, Mel Brooks, this is the first time he actually played the lead in a film. He's actually the person who's um, throughout the entire film. I think this is another really accomplished, I mean, he nails the whole Hitchcock look. Oh, especially you know, the, the dolly shots. You know. It's also a beautiful film. I mean, you know, the, the, and, you know, however it was shot, widescreen scope, whatever you want And when to he's it. trying to climb the stairs and looks down, he mimics the vertigo thing with the stairs. He right. Had the, yeah, the, you know, the reverse camera elongating of the it's shot. It's not like the funniest film in the sense no, that, no. you know, it's not like Blazing Saturday or even Young Frank. It's still pretty funny, but it's got though. some great things. I it's mean, very dry. Like, I love Corman's evil, you know, the psychiatric head and, and how he keeps, like, putting the vampire teeth. Yeah, that I was going to mention. That is the best scene. If you're looking for a highlight reel of Harvey Corman at the movies when he's trying to uh, make the... Uh, Patients still seem crazy, and he'll put the vampire teeth in, but then as soon as Mel Brooks looks at him, he takes it out. He's playing it straight, but then he'll just put them back into his mouth. That is, you know, that to me is truly comic gold. Oh, I, I think his his assistant, Cloris Leachman, with the uh, Oh, that the relationship. <laughs> oh, my God. She has the big, like, iron tits, basically. <laughs> yeah. and then there's that scene where it's like, I want you to come to my bed tonight, not tonight. I'm tired. I'll let you wear the underwear. Okay. <laughs> I, love, I love the uh, the one that has me cry laughing every time is the birds parody where the birds shitting all over him and running to the outhouse. That, that's pretty. Funny. I was just like, who would come up with something that sick? It's really disgusting, and but it's who, hysterical. Who was the actor who wore the braces? Who was the killer? I don't know who that was. But he in his scenes he's hilarious, especially when he has that maniacal laugh and then you do the close up on his teeth. I don't know. That scene just kills me. The right there. Well, that's like you said before, like we mentioned Young Frankenstein, how you said he's obviously a fan of the films that he's parroting. You Obviously, he's watched the Albert Hitchcock yeah. films really lovingly and did a very affectionate homage. Um, he's, a, he's a smart movie guy. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy's a guy that loves movies and he knows his shit. Plus, he's an awesome producer as well. Well, yes, I forget. He produced The Elephant Man for David Lynch. Yes, indeed. Anyway, let's go on to the next one. The next one, actually, uh, is Mel Brooks attempting, uh, I guess, a film in the style of Kentucky Fried Movie, which is the skit movie, which is History of the World Part 1, um, which is, uh, I guess, the dawn of man to the future uh, in outer space. Um, this one actually has many, many uh, funny moments. In fact, some very quotable lines. Uh, it's good to be the king. Um, I don't know. When First, are they going to outer space? At the end. Remember Jews in space? But oh, yeah, but that was like a little... Yeah, they didn't like, really yeah. show anything. It's a little joke, you know. But um, For some reason, History of the World, I don't know, it just wasn't as strong as the stuff from the, you know, the the 70s and the late 60s. It wasn't, but it still wasn't as poor as what was to follow. Yeah, but yeah. It, it, there was this is like that we, middle period where all of a sudden it's like he started kind of aping himself a little mm -hmm. bit. And I don't know, some of the stuff, a lot of the stuff rang a little hollow. The Inquisition bar, part is really funny. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, the 15 Commandments. That was kind of funny. I, some funny though, like piss boy, piss yeah. boy. You know, that was kind of funny. You know, but it, yeah, they were starting to get like he was starting to get, I, for lack of better terms, muddy in his humor, where it was like just really pushing the rudeness, and you're just like, okay, it was funny one or two times, but I just felt it was, got? I felt it was like an old, a dirty old man actually, because I mean, the thing about his humor, even though it was some of it was risque before, it was it was sweet. This one was like a little. Well, mean they're better spare. thought out. I mean, you could tell that a lot of work and skill went into thinking out the gags and stuff. It wasn't just about that. You know, whereas whereas in this one, it just seems like they're all like you know shock gags, and it's like it felt lazy to me. Mm -hmm. It was more coasting than anything. Yeah. You know what's so funny too is that mm -hmm. Mel Brooks actually produced another film very similar to this one called Loose Shoes, which uh, has fallen in the public domain, and uh, it's a very it's a sketch comedy movie too. It has um, Bill Murray's in it and a few <clears throat> others. Uh, it's very similar. I mean, you guys want to, might want to check that out. Um, but I mean, like I said, the stuff in the with, with Bill, Mel Brooks as the king is very enjoyable, and it's worth it for that. Anyway, after that, Mel Brooks took a little sabbatical. He became more of a film producer, as we said. We mentioned he produced The Elephant Man, The Fly. He actually starred in a movie called To Be or Not To Be with his wife, Anne Bancroft. And then he returned to filmmaking six years later with Spaceballs, which is a parody of the Star Wars films, but it's 10 years later. So a lot of the jokes might seem kind of dated at the time. And Not only that, this is the big problem with the film. What was great about something like, like Blazing Saddles or even better, Young Frankenstein and uh, High Anxiety is that he captured and nailed the look, the whole thing. And this one, he doesn't even try. It just no. feels like airplane, airplane light, or like like the naked gun, you know? And there's no Some attempt to Some of the stuff to... in it's kind of funny. I mean, I think Rick Duran is amusing a very stuff. effective. There is amusing stuff in it, but but this is a film that could have been directed by the Zucker Brothers, or it could yeah. have been directed by, you know, someone. It just, it doesn't. True. It, the it, one real, to me, the one real true Mel Brooks moment is the end. 
with bringing John Hurt in at the cameo at the breakfast table again, or at the oh, bar. Yeah. The spoofed yeah. alien. That is the one like real Mel Brooks moment we get. Everything else you're right. Oh it, no, it, not again. It does feel like uh, oh. you'd expect out of a Zucker. Don't forget the uh, the great uh, Planet of the Apes homage too. I don't even remember. Oh, when the they, they helmet, the, you know, the, the Statue of Liberty helmet, the spaceship, remember, falls onto the planet and it's the Planet of the Apes going, oh shit, there goes the planet. You don't remember that? Barely. It's, it's, exactly. And also, we got to mention too, uh, uh, Rick Moranis was pretty damn funny. Yeah, he was the best part. I and think. also, uh, let's not forget John Candy. He was a lot of fun to watch as well. Yeah, he wasn't given a whole lot to do. I mean, he was a mog. Yeah. Half man, half dog. dog. I'm my own best friend. Uh, God, I can't believe Bill I Pullman that. was very flat as the hero. Well, I mean, it's I just, think appropriately so, though. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? It just He was wasn't... no Gene Wilder, though. He was basically playing a Gene Wilder role. It, it, like I said, it, was, it wasn't. It, it was like, with, at least with Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, and uh, High Anxiety, he, he took a lot of great care. Like, you could tell he loved the genre he was making fun of, so it looked like one of those films as well as made fun of it. Well, he probably saw Star just, Wars is, and goes, I can do this, I can parody this without having that love and fondness of but, it. But, but True. He, I don't know. It's just it, I, hate to, I hate to wrap this up, guys. we got to wrap this up. we only got a few more seconds here. Um, and Nancy Allen. Yeah. Oh, uh, you mean? Or not Nancy Allen. Denise. 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 She was not, uh, she uh, wasn't much as a principal. And his casting choices became uh, odd well, later films. some of those were forced on He didn't have his repertory so, yeah. with him anymore. So what's left is well, Dracula Well, we only got a few seconds here, but we'll just mention it. He, he did three more films. Life Stinks, which is actually not bad. It's actually pretty funny. And he did Robin Hood, Men in Tights, which actually was based on an old TV show he, used to, he did in the 60s called uh, Think When Things Were Rotten. And then he wrapped it up with a film that tried to do... Uh, Young Frankenstein for Dracula, which was Dracula Dead and Loving It, which unfortunately didn't do that well and it was not that good of a movie. After that, Mel Brooks kept a quiet profile and, as I said earlier, went to become a playwright. And, and now his it. son is an expert on zombies. Hey, go ahead. Max Brooks, there you go. Well, Mel Brooks, uh, I gotta say, you're definitely a comic genius, I guess we can all say. I, your favorite is the producers. What about you? Uh, Blazing Saddles. Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein here as well. Um, the one film I think we can all avoid, agree to avoid to see is uh, Dracula Dead and Loving It. It's, it's just a, it, anyone could have directed that. Like you said, it, it's basically a Wayans Brothers film. Scary, scary movie. But you know five something? It, it's gonna, it would be hard pressed to say who's today's Al, uh, Mel Brooks. I don't think there is a today's Mel Brooks. No. No. There's nobody doing Well, someone might make the argument that the Frelly brothers are sort of the modern day Mel Brooks. No, but they've it really, they, they've done like two good films and then really fallen off. Really at least close. at least Mel Brooks has a canon. We're talking about the Mel Brooks of Blazing Saddles, the Mel Brooks of Young Frankenstein, the Mel Brooks of High Anxiety. The, yeah, but know, the, he had a catalog. The Frelly brothers did two pretty funny films, and that's about it. Right? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, maybe three. Well, anyway, uh, this was the Cinephiles. This was show was uh, our, our brief look at the career of Mel Brooks, and uh, we want to dedicate this to the late Harvey Corman, who was a, definitely a wonderful comedic actor, uh, one of the wonderful actors in uh, Mel Brooks's comic repertoire. Well, and this has nothing to do with Mel Brooks, but his uh, role or his time on Carol Burnett show was just classic. I mean, just absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and Harvey, we won't, we will, we will try to forget munchies. <laughs> <laughs> the better, the better, better, best uh, forgotten for that one. Uh, it's a horrible New World uh, Gremlin to rip off, which is oh, unwatchable. Anyway, until I'm next sure week. I'm sure his soul is resting peacefully now that <laughs> hey, you just did that. Hey, watch, watch Blazing Saddles. Yeah. That's the best way to remember uh, Mr. Especially. As, as Mr. Corman is Hedley. Hedley, Hedley Lamar. Lamar. Yeah. yeah, actually, you know, he got sued for that. You know. By Hedley, Hedley, the real Hedy Lamar sued Mel Brooks and them for, uh, you know, saying, you know, how dare you make fun of me? Ah, uh, we ran out of gas. Oh, there we go. There, there, there we go. go. There we go. Well, yeah. Guess what bit's going to be cut out of this tape? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> no, I think we should leave it in just to give uh, people mm -hmm. more of an idea of what uh, what us cinephiles are like uh, when the camera We're is. We're pompous assholes. Yes. You got me in the mood to see the Twelve Chairs again. Actually, I, I have seen to that see part. that again. It's been a while. Is Maybe that on DVD? Time. Yeah, I was wondering when you were running their credits. Our director's even coming out during the show. I did. You know, I said, you know I said, the camera's still rolling. In there. There's <laughs> <a director. laughs> oh, such a professional outfit. Like this. Wait, wait. <laughs>